Hello, my name is Kim Eagle for ACC.org, and we're at the American Heart Association meetings talking about important trials presented on day two. I'm joined today by Pyle Coley from Denver and Deepak Bhatt from Boston, Massachusetts. Today, we're going to talk about um, four trials that were released today. Uh, one looks at ECMO. Another is looking at potential value of icosapent ethyl. Um, we have one, an extended follow-up of the ischemia trial, you remember. And finally, uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors uh, get a good look in patients with renal disease. So let's start with a randomized trial of uh, ECMO in patients with cardiogenic shock. Kyle? Uh, the idea here was if patients coming in with shock should be put on VA ECMO upfront and early before organ dysfunction starts to ensue, or whether they should be managed without VA ECMO with the idea that they could cross over later on if they needed it. So this was a randomized trial of about 122 patients and really showed actually no difference in the primary endpoint, which was a composite of death from any cause circulatory arrest, and other MCS options. But I'll comment here that there was a huge amount of crossover. So about 39% of patients who were initially uh, randomized to a conservative strategy actually ended up getting ECMO later. Uh, the authors also acknowledged that they used a, a power calculation that assumed a 50% reduction with the intervention, which may have been a little bit aggressive but a, a null trial, I would say, in a, in a difficult to study population, but it does tell us that there was also no harm in doing upfront VA ECMO, no increased risk of bleeding, no increased risk of leg ischemia or sepsis or any other complications. So I would say it's really dealer's choice at this point, but we should feel confident putting our patients on VA ECMO early in the course of their treatment for shock. Yeah, I agree with you. The, uh, the power calculation was really optimistic. But certainly the safety here is, is something that we can fall back on. Uh, and we use our clinical judgment to decide when do we think ECMO is most indicated in a given patient. And studying shock patients is very challenging. It's nice to see a trial that even attempts to do that. Uh, Deepak, the uh, icosapent ethyl story continues to evolve. Uh, tell us about uh, RESPECT EPA. Yeah, absolutely. This was a study done in Japan, a randomization 1.8 grams a day of icosapent ethyl versus not. That's what open label means, that there wasn't a matching placebo, but it was randomized. Uh, these were patients, again, from Japan uh, who had uh, known uh, cardiovascular disease, but actually who ended up having essentially normal triglycerides, unlike, say, Reduce It, where everyone had high triglycerides. And these were patients with, I'd say, reasonably well-controlled LDL. The average LDL baseline was like 80 uh, milligrams per deciliter or something like that. So these patients were randomized. And, you know, it was a bit of an underpowered study out of the gate, about 1,200 or so patients in each arm. So, uh, you know, it, perhaps a bit optimistic in terms of powering in this trial as well. Uh, but the overall primary endpoint um, was a composite of cardiovascular death, non-fatal 9, non-fatal ischemic stroke, unstable angina coronary revascularization. Uh, and I'll say the primary endpoint was met, but you know one could quibble about the statistics. The p-value was 0.054. The upper bound of the 95% confidence interval was 1.001, I think. So you know one could say, strictly speaking, that's not a statistically significant value because it's not 0.05 or less. But again, I thought pretty close for that primary endpoint, a hazard ratio of 0.785. Uh, the secondary endpoint, which was sudden cardiac death, MI, unstable angina, coronary revascularization, there the hazard ratio was 0.73. There the p-value was 0.03. So that was clearly statistically significant. Looking at the Kaplan-Meier curves for both the primary endpoint and the secondary endpoint, it was clear that a few years after randomization, the curves were clearly separating. So my assessment was that it was a positive trial, that there's a something there that um, in this population, this dose worked. I'll just point out, uh, compared with Reduce It, you know, this was a lower dose of icosapentethyl, 1.8 grams a day. Reduce It used four grams total per day. As well, these are Japanese patients, um, and their EPA levels are higher than in Western populations. Uh, they did do some sort of enrichment here based on EPA-AA ratio, but even still, uh, their levels are uh, like an order of magnitude higher than in Western populations. And I think the lack of high triglycerides here, I mean, that's a powerful risk factor. One can debate whether it's a modifiable risk factor per se, 
But for sure, if your trigs are elevated, despite statin and dietary counseling, you're at higher risk. So uh, much lower risk population than reduce it, but qualitatively, another, I'd say, a positive trial, much like JELUS, a prior Japanese trial, also open label with some limitations, but there as well, uh, a hazard ratio that uh, favored the study drug once more. That was a lower dose, 1.8. So to me, you know, it's a consistency across multiple different trials, and, um, you know, I think there's a something there to EPA-based therapy. I totally agree with you. And uh, for the folks who really questioned reduce it, now we have several other points of data suggesting the benefit of the drug uh, in different populations, which is very reassuring. Let's move on then. Uh, ischemia was a huge trial looking at uh, management of coronary heart disease. And today is the five-year follow-up, extended follow-up of ischemia. Pyle, tell us about this result. So, you know, ischemia, to remind everybody, was initial invasive versus conservative strategy for chronic CAD patients who had moderate or severe uh, ischemia. And, you know, in the initial follow-up, there was really no difference in the primary endpoint, although their angina, if they had angina, they did do better with the invasive strategy uh, and it did improve their quality of life as well. And so this is an interim look with a median follow-up of 5.7 years. Um, and here we see that there was actually no difference in all cause death but there was a reduction of 22% in cardiovascular death, but an increase of 44% in non-cardiovascular death. And, and the idea is if, if you get randomized to an invasive strategy, you have more periprocedural MIs, but do those translate into a, you know, a different survival as opposed to having fewer spontaneous MIs, which is what happens when you get that initial invasive strategy. So what we see here is kind of a complicated null effect on overall mortality, reduction in cardiovascular death, but increase in non-cardiovascular death. So for me, you know, I think that this tells me that I need to have a more nuanced and sophisticated conversation with my patients uh, when I'm deciding whether to send them to the cath lab or not, because it doesn't impact their overall survival, it can improve their quality of life up front if they have angina, but that may translate into more non-cardiovascular death down the line. I, t I really agree with you. I, it, it reminds me of kind of the debate we have with aspirin these days, bleeding versus vascular benefit. And uh, this trial really does illustrate how these curves diverged in the non-cardiac the non mortality and, and outcomes late. You know, Deepak, the uh, SGLT2 inhibitors just continue to rock the cardiovascular world uh, and their benefit in heart failure is, is clearly proven now it's a pillar of treatment. The EMPA kidney uh, trial here is looking at renal function and SGLT2. Tell us about that. Yeah, absolutely. This is another important trial, important in general, important in the SGLT2 inhibitor world. I'll say another positive trial adding to the slew of positive trials that you were alluding to with SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, so with EMPA kidney, these were patients with chronic kidney disease, a pretty broad array of patients with chronic kidney disease with respect to GFR and your and albumin creatinine ratio. So a uh, very broad range of kidney disease, both diabetes and without diabetes, randomized empagliflozin 10 a day versus placebo. Uh, the primary uh, composite of CV death or kidney disease progression was very significantly reduced uh, in the overall trial as well in patients with prior CV disease, without prior CV disease, significant uh, reductions in that endpoint. So I would say overall positive study. And uh, as far as some additional outcomes, looking at CV death or heart failure hospitalization, there were some recurrent event analyses, first event analyses, overall suggesting a lower rate that wasn't statistically significant per se, but hazard ratios around 0 0.84, 0 0.83, confidence intervals overlapping unity, though. Uh, there was a reduction in all hospitalization that was significant, though heart failure hospitalization per se is an isolated category heading in the right direction. Again, hazard ratio of about 0.8, uh, but not strictly speaking, statistically significant. And, and MACE, major adverse cardiovascular events, that is CV death, MI stroke, or they defined it to include hospitalization for heart failure as well. There, that wasn't significantly reduced either on first event analyses or total event analyses, but was heading numerically in the right direction with a hazard ratio of 0.93. So uh, overall, I think this adds to the large and growing database that SGLT2 inhibitors work in patients with chronic kidney disease, either with or without diabetes. And here we see either with or without cardiovascular disease. So great data, useful data. And I think best viewed uh, with the totality of evidence that other trials have also shown benefits now 
in patients with CKD. We saw that with DAPA CKD. We saw it with Credence. We saw it with the SCORE trial. So it really does appear that patients with chronic kidney disease, uh, that many of them should be on SGLT2 inhibitors, even if they don't have diabetes. And this adds to the SGLT2 inhibitor data that supports broad use of these agents in patients with heart failure, with reduced or preserved ejection fraction with or without diabetes. And of course, they're also good diabetes drugs for patients with diabetes that don't have either of those conditions. Yeah, I think uh, for clinicians who might have been fearful that the renal dysfunction was a safety issue with these agents, this flips that completely on its head and suggests that, in fact, these are patients who specifically benefit from this class of agents and we should be using them more. Well, there you have it, day two of the American Heart Association, a trial looking at uh, ECMO for shock, uh, an interesting study looking at icosapent ethyl. We got an update on the long-term follow-up of ischemia. And finally, another uh, very interesting trial looking at SGLT2 inhibitors. I want to thank Deepak and Pyle for joining us today. This is Kim Eagle for ACC.org, and I'm out. <laughs>